in Southampton, where the council and subcontractor Balfour Beatty share responsibility for the upkeep of 416 miles of highways. There is a swelling disquiet about the daily experiences we have on our roads. Cycle lanes in Portsmouth Road are barely visible now. I don't feel safe. I don't go down Portsmouth Road on a bike anymore. It's one of the most dangerous roads in Southampton. That is a particularly awful stretch of cycle lane. It disappears, then runs you into a line of parked cars. The infrastructure in many places is terrible, yet they want to encourage us out of our cars. There are so many people on electric oh, scooters. Train to return the Use of shared cars. Send an email to the civil enforcement Did you Make Southampton Community Media, in partnership with the University of Southampton Public Engagement with Research Unit, set out to explore the local travel challenges of six residents and their impact on their health and well-being. Meet Nathan in his 20s from Highfield, Gemma in her 30s from Weston, Pete in his 50s from Portswood, Francis in her 60s from Scholing. Anne in her 80s from Bitten. Genevieve in her 90s from Shirley. Southampton has been dubbed the traffic light capital of the South. Whether it deserves this reputation or not, idling engines at red lights cause not only pollution, but a financial drain on the elderly residents relying on taxis for essential journeys. Genevieve lives with her son Milo in Shirley. None of them drives. <laughs> um, I used to belong to all kinds of groups, um, art art groups, mm -hmm. lectures and um, visits to uh, art galleries and talks and things like that, and also um, uh, walks and so on. Very active, but not now. I'm too. I'm not capable of it now. I used to take taxis for shopping at food at Sainsbury's. I was always stuck at the traffic lights a long time and I'd watch the meter going up yeah. and up. Yeah. And I get more traffic lights and the meter goes up even more. Those traffic lights at the, at the, at the Hill Lane arches, well, they're terrible. You're in a taxi there and yeah. then suddenly it, it grinds to a halt when there's a traffic jam and, and you just see the meter just yeah. going up and up and up and it's, it's it costs about five pounds just standing still at the traffic light. I've been living in this, this house, in this house alone, and not going out for so many years. Is it is about three now, or what, four? I never go out, out anywhere now. I haven't been out much since before lockdown. No, but I've forgotten how angry I used to get, and I've forgotten where the traffic lights were. But yeah. always Hill Lane, Archers, Hill Lane, Road, Archers Road, Road, seemed to be very long. But it is an intersection of the roads, isn't it? Yes. Hill Lane and, roads, and Archers Road. Yeah. You wait ages there. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a bus, you know. The buses used have to work bus. <laughs> in those days. They, they were they very were, good. They were much better than they are now. When we first came here in 1976, there were two buses, one in Hill Lane and one in down there. That, that was the 5, the 2 and the 2A. And they were all like every 10 minutes. Gradually, they, they became fewer and fewer and fewer. And after a while, they took away the bus that even goes down Hill Lane because obviously not, not enough people were getting on it. And I really felt cut off from the world because... I haven't got a bus, yeah. and my scooter doesn't go very far. So. And from the from the day from the day on when 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 they took away that bus, you, you you've never been to town since, I don't think. Are there any places in town you used to like to go? To? In town, well, not really in town. There's only West Key, isn't there? Quite that? like Bedford Place. Well, when we first came here, all yeah. sorts of shops. Well, Bedford Place yeah. can't get there. No bus anymore. It's a shame. Bedford Place, I like that. There's a good health shop there, and shoe shop. Second-hand shops. I like shops. Mm -hmm. 
The Community Bus Service Dial-A-Ride, sponsored by Southampton City Council and operated by SCA Transport, offers a lifeline for residents with reduced mobility, but the service operates only on weekdays from 9 to 4 p.m. Good morning, Dial-A-Ride. Frank speaking. Hello, Frank. It's Anne Harvey here. Um, Hi there. Hi. Could I please make um, a booking for um, to get to Tesco's next Wednesday, please? You can indeed. Um, he normally picks you up around, is it around 11.15? Well, somewhere around 11 o'clock, yes. Yeah, if I pop it down. Um... On Wednesday, there is a scheduled trip to Tesco's when... Uh, the driver does a round trip collecting everyone from their houses. We get to Tesco's at about half past 11 and uh, we get picked up again at one o'clock and then taken back to our homes. You, you have to um, not be able to use uh, public transport which I can't do because there is none in this area. I, well, I use the community bus when I can, or I have to walk. Um, if I go to the eye hospital for an appointment, um, I have to take a 20-minute walk to get to the nearest bus stop to get the bus into town, change buses and get to Coxford Road um, on another bus and then I have a further 10 minute walk to get to the eye unit. If it is pouring with rain and I'm likely to get soaked to the skin, I have to take a taxi which is extremely expensive and on a, a, a pension that becomes very difficult. In 2022, many significant changes were introduced in the UK to encourage healthier ways to travel, for public health reasons as well as the health of our planet. A new hierarchy of road users was introduced to the Highways Code to encourage driver awareness of more vulnerable road users. Active Travel England was launched to work with local authorities to drive up standards in cycling and walking infrastructure. In Southampton, the City Council held a number of public consultations on some of the government's funded schemes to encourage more people to walk, cycle and scoot. Nathan, a civil engineer student at the University of Southampton, has been testing Southampton's cycle lanes using the e-scooters, mushrooming in our city. Living at Halls, I've got a free bus pass that comes with the accommodation package. So I regularly use the buses in the city, but also cycle, walk and e-scooters tend to be, depending on where I am in the city or what's most convenient, so going on, the, going on the avenue, it's just such a long straight road. There are so many different types of protection on, for such a short piece of road relatively. Uh, through the common, you've got no lanes, then lanes halfway down for some reason that are protected by little plastic nicknamed armadillos. Then further on, you've got a dirt track or a shared path pavement on the other side. Further on, it gets a little bit better. There's concrete curbs and bollards, uh, protected cycle lanes there, but then you get dumped on the pavement at the, at the junction, the crossing point, but then really good protected lanes down the Inn Avenue, but then you just get dumped on the road down London Road. 
To me, the best analogy I think I can come up with is for a cycle route, a safe protected cycle route that just stops, or a cycle network that is fragmented, it's the same as just you're driving along on a motorway and then suddenly it becomes a dirt track and you're veering all over the place and then suddenly it's a motorway but it's all zigzaggy and then there's a straight dirt track and it's just all over the place. Southampton City Council have a generic tube style map of the uncompleted Southampton cycle network and I believe there are other maps on the City Council website for guidance uh, but generally I use OpenStreetMap which is a map, open source mapping software, which I have also edited the routes onto myself, collecting from videos and user experience. Uh, and it's easy to see where the routes go, and of course almost how fragmented they are too. So here you can see the routes around the common, uh, where the light blue is the route itself, and the dark blue is where there's dedicated cycle infrastructure. So you can see there's still a lot of light blue in places and disconnected dark blue bits everywhere. So there's not many properly connected, safe, continuous, convenient. You see places with, without, drop, without drop curves and tactile paving and different resurfacing schemes. You get residential roads that have been resurfaced and major bus routes haven't. There's just lots of things that need to be further brought to be more consistent in upkeep in the city and improvements to the city. The local transport notes issued by the government specify an absolute minimum width of 1.5 metres for cycle lanes, but best practice implementation on Southampton's roads is still work in progress, which makes cycling for people with disabilities off limits on local roads. Today's event has been organised by Peter Hull, the Community Engagement Lead for the charity Active Nations, in partnership with Pedal New Forest. These people are both the most popular trikes, these yeah. semi-recumbents, because they suit so many different types of people. But rather than calling them adaptive bikes, no, they're, yeah. they're specially designed trikes. Yeah. Um, so they've all been made from scratch with specific kind of purposes in mind. Mm, absolutely. Um, Nick, who has cerebral palsy, is enjoying a bit of freedom and being in charge of a bike next to his mum. Yeah. Especially his bike used to make that yeah. fast and slow thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. so what, is it good? Yeah. Yeah? It is like, like a car, mum. Like, like, like driving a car? Like an electric car, mum. Oh, right, yeah. You're in charge? Oh, this is weird. you in charge? <laughs> oh, my God. I can enjoy. <laughs> I can make it go... Faster or slower. Okay. Well, just watch where you're steering. I know yeah. where I'm going. Right. I'm not quite sure. It's quite good, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Could take. I could take. Someone like James could go on this bike. Because yeah. yeah. he wouldn't have to pedal. I could pedal it for him. So I could take people. The idea for this bike. It's to take somebody who's less able. Yeah. So if they don't, so like you can pedal now if you want to, but you don't have to. It doesn't make any difference if you do. In his private life, Peter is used to overcoming personal obstacles, but some of the daily infrastructure challenges, as well as behaviour of others, cause unnecessary pain. So these medals are from uh, the Barcelona Paralympics 1992. Um, always world records, um, 50 meter backstroke, 50 meter freestyle, and 100 meters freestyle. And the one down the bottom there is a, a commemorative medallion. So yeah, when I when I go out in my in my uh, you know in my power chair, I'm experiencing all kinds of um, physical obstacles, but also people's negative um, attitudes, and sometimes you're feeling sort of second rate. I mean, I remember once. And um, a, a van, I think it was, obstructing a, a drop curb, and uh, and uh, the driver was was still in it, and was still in the was still in the van, and I asked him to, you know, excuse me, can you move? And he completely completely ignored me, you know, as if I you know, if I, you know as if I wasn't there. On a good day, I get on the bus, um, and um, go go to where I need to go, and everything's everything's hunky dory. Um, on a bad day, I could be doing exactly the same thing, but I could encounter 
bins obstructing obstructing the path pathway. And sometimes I can move them. Sometimes, um, for, for whatever reason, maybe too heavy or, or, or whatever, or there's nowhere appropriate for me to to push them. I'll have to then trace my steps, find a drop curb, get onto the get onto the pavement, regardless of what the traffic's like, so I can then get round get round that that obstacle. When I'm when I'm going down when I'm going down the pavement and I'll, I'll see in, see in the distance that um, the pavement's been dug up. Most of the time, they do provide you with a with an alternative. So they'll they'll cone off they'll cone off a, a, an area um, for you to sort of walk walk around. So saying pedestrians this way, but often that is a very small gap. So um, there have been a couple of times where it. You know, I've, I've really struggled to fit, you know, down that little alley. Also, that um, if there's like some cabling, um, obviously for, for safety reasons, they have to put got these yellow portable pavements on this chair. I'm lucky in that I've got a reclining facility, so I can tip the tip the chair back. But if someone's just sat, sat bolt upright and they haven't got a much uh, sort of core strength, going back down that 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 bit of the pavement you know the whole chairs going sort of going forward so that can be that can be hazardous, hazardous in, it, um, in itself where uh, if I um, go over a bump in the road or the pavement or a pothole or or something because um, I'm obviously sat in a chair I've got um, my one one arm is either on on the on the other arm or the other one is on the joystick of the of the chair if the chair hits a bump then that goes right, right through, through directly through to my shoulder, and that can that can be uh, that can be uncomfortable. The other side of the city, Frances is ready to try her new scooter with her son, but as Peter Hull described earlier, going from A to B is not as easy as it sounds. very active as a teacher before I became ill. Yeah, you yeah. used to go out to the theatre, you used to go to the cinema, like, go out for meals, like... And, and now it, everything is really limited. Well, I, I haven't really been out much in the last two years because how do I do that? I can't catch a bus. I can catch a taxi, but that's very expensive. Um, and yeah. my, I can't walk very far, and my legs are all right. It's my spine that's damaged, and my balance because of having two brain tumours removed. Eric Reed is a retired highways inspector with 50 years of experience of Southampton roads. A week ago, all of this pavement was up, and they had uh, it was completely blocked off. I couldn't. Uh, go left or right getting out of here mm. and that was for a few days and they were 
digging up the road for some new uh, the cable company. Cable. They've upset my neighbours because they've damaged their supply. Have they? Yeah. Have they? Has it been reported? Have they reported um, it to the council? I, I have no idea if yeah. they have or not. Yeah. But they were all out up in arms, that side, that side. It's, it is a bit disconcerting if you were obstructed, obstructed with your access. Normally they would make yeah. provision for access. No, or, I mean, you could get out of the driveway if you were going into a car, but the you couldn't pavement make progress. was blocked off no, no, both so, ways. So, as with any utility, it used to be that the council had, had uh, highways inspectors yeah. who used to go out and inspect the excavations. But nowadays, that doesn't happen. They, the, the utilities companies can send in a license. I mean, I don't know if you know all this or not, but uh, utilities companies just send in a notice to the council right. that works are going to be undertaken. And, um, and then they also uh, resurface them because the situation that the council um, comes under is issuing defaults if mm -hmm. the services um, really statements in the highway are not done properly. In a path like this, because it's a fully built up area, yeah. you're likely to have every service here. That's you've right. got electricity, you've got gas, you've got, you're in a, you've got water, and you've also got the old, what was historically an area like this, going back in time before BT, po what was known as post office telephones, you know, yes. you're, the age of your housing is, is that old, that they'll have those sort of systems installed in the footway. So because it's only a narrow footway, right. then the cable otter would, would know what's there yes. and they'd have to try and find a space in between to put their apparatus in. In 2018, the Conservative Secretary of State for Transport, Chris Grayling, came up with proposals that utility companies should dig up the pavements instead of the roads to avoid causing road potholes. But after encountering opposition, during the consultation period, the proposal was withdrawn. Companies that dig up the pavements have a legal obligation to repair just their bit of dug up area, which is why they are ending up with patchwork pavements that cause unnecessary pain and worry for many residents. Go ahead. Is there many other points where you've had difficulties going up and down the road, or I suppose you haven't had the, well, the chair long enough to, uh, to try everywhere out yet? No, I'm, I'm quite frightened of yeah. going too far. Um, have you made the council or your councillors aware of your issues to uh, help with no. trying to modify the past? Because if they don't know, normally you see the budgets are so restricted within local right. government, they've only got a limited budget where provision for uh, disabled facilities can be made. Uh, tactile paving and other measures are looked at on a sort of case-by-case -case basis by many authorities because they only try and target money where it's really needed. Unless you ask, you, you, won't, no. you won't know, but if there's any particular really hazardous bits, from, uh, for, because... Um, okay, that, that's hazardous. Well, so this is a particularly rough section. So it looks like they were originally proposing to put the two box in the footway, but instead it's been relocated to, to another position clear of the access. But this whole access area of crossover, the edge has been reinstated where the cables have been put in. But the whole of the rest of it, you can see what a poor state it is. Very high uplift at the back. It looks like this is possibly damaged when the building works were done. Possibly, I don't know. It's been like that a long time. Yeah, so there's a high lift here. It's not, it's not been totally resurfaced across the full width from the new high upstand. To the back. Did they? Yeah, yeah. Well, if they, yeah, yeah. Well, if they paid to have the drop, if they really, yeah. Well, if they paid for a drop curb, it doesn't look like it's been installed because uh, there's what. This is, this is all Southampton City Council's responsibility as the highway authority for this area. So if it was outside of the city boundaries, it would be Hampshire County Council in this part of the world. But um, if it's in the city boundaries itself, it's Southampton City Council, the primary body, and they've got their contractor, Balfour Beatty, who's involved with undertaking yeah, works. 
Gemma, another local resident, has become an ace at reporting issues to the council and some of them get rectified. But it took her years of practice, which turned her into an accessibility activist. Gemma was invited to give evidence at the council's scrutiny inquiry into how easy it is for disabled people to access places and buildings like anyone else can do. Mark Purney, the scrutiny manager, agreed to take a walk with Gemma to a recently completed scheme that she is critical of. So yeah, it takes an awful lot of research to go anywhere new and sometimes I have to just say, I can't do this. Um, but I've managed to find that Saints Foundation run Pan Disability Football. It's over in Lord's Hill and um, it finishes at 10 o'clock at night and there isn't a bus to take me to town until 5 to 11. And because it finishes so late, taxis charge extra. So even to get just as far as town, not even halfway, like halfway home, we're looking at sort of 12 to 15 pounds. Right now, Transport is stopping me from playing sport and I love playing sport. Mark, I was really like pleased and grateful to be part of giving evidence to the, the scrutiny panel inquiry. Um, how did it come about? In terms of your contact details, actually Councillor Filker provided mm. me with your contact details. She made me aware that, that you'd like to give evidence um, along with a number of others. So that's why I, I reached out. Again, all of our inquiries should be based on local interest, local perspectives, residents' feedback, um, so, so that's exactly what we do. Yeah. So I, I never discourage anybody from wanting to engage and give evidence. So I will manage an inquiry, but it's led by elected members and nothing, can, nothing is better for members to understand issues and challenges than speaking to people who have to live through those mm. directly. So that's why you were invited, that's why we, we made sure that in the inquiry we work closely with Spectrum Seal uh, and Ian Loins to make sure that uh, the voice of disabled people was front and centre and to make sure that there was a, a forum that helped feed into the inquiry. The opportunity to, to give evidence and tell the, the panel about my life and some of the issues that you know, bad design, yeah. for example, causes was was a great opportunity for me. And, and we like, you know, we like to get national experts in because national experts can give us uh, a, a bigger issue, a bigger understanding of some of the policies, strategies, approaches, good practice. Um, and, and we like to get them in early in the inquiry. So we, we did that with um, the chief executive of Access Able as well as our director of adult social care. But that gives us a big picture. Our elected members want to know what the challenges are on the ground in the city. They don't know the challenges, apart from when people like you contact our elected members directly as part of their casework. Yep. But for you can say, point out the challenges for the new West Quay, the challenges with some of the um, transport interchanges. Our members can straight relate to that. And some of the, uh, and the videos that you presented um, to the panel. Oh, I know that road. Yeah, I've seen that before. Oh, I can move. And they can understand that they can move in and out of it. But now they can say, hold on, if I was in a wheelchair and I was partially sighted, that's a whole different perspective. Why are we doing it like that? So again, that, yeah. that's brilliant for them. And, and that is actually why I started making TikTok videos, because I got really frustrated trying to find out which departments were responsible for which areas. And I was, you know, sending letters and sending in inquiries to try and get things that fixed and then not hearing back because I'd actually contacted the wrong department and things like that were happening. And so I took to social media just really to, to get it out there. I want to take you and show you um, a bus stop that's recently been modified by the council and show you some of the issues that I've found with it. You up for that? Yeah, I'll follow you. Let's go. The Accessible Southampton Inquiry found that the Residential Design Guide, which provides detailed design guidance to transform the city and its neighbourhoods to turn them into better places for living, has not been updated since 2006. It has also found that the local manual for streets, called Streetscape Toolkit, was last updated in 2013. For a little while I had a volunteer work placement just up the road. So this is, this is where I got off the bus. And 
I can't tell you, Mark, the fear of stepping off the bus there and knowing that only a few feet away is a cycle path. There could be someone going down it at speed. Did, did you like? Did you have, did you come across any, any challenges, any problems, or was it just the fear that it could happen that, that's um, really presented? I definitely anxiety. had bikes going past at speed um, and showing no caution whatsoever, even with the lovely pretend zebra crossing we've got over there. But actually, on the other side of the road coming home, I was actually nearly hit. It was really close. Like, I felt the air of the bike pass me. Um, and again, that was because I was stepping out to, because my bus was there. Given that you've worked here, and work experience here, is this part of your areas where you, you're comfortable? Yeah. But again, cars stopping on this crossing like this causes me real problems. Because now I can't cross in case the traffic moves. So I've got to wait for that car to go before I can cross the road. Around the corner there, there's a zebra crossing for people to cross. And um, it's really faded. And so cars don't obey it. They just go straight past. And like, I've nearly been hit on that crossing so many times. So this bus stop here is actually where I was nearly hit trying to get on a bus. Because this side here is the bus, uh, it's yep. lane. Yep. Um, but again, there's not a lot to tell me that. And there's not a lot of warning. And I initially didn't realise that that was cycle lane now. In the past few weeks since May 2023, Southampton City Council announced the successful funding bid from the Department of Transport to improve high-profile streets in our city centre and money to repair Portsmouth Road in Wollstone, SO19, mentioned at the beginning of this film. However, for many residents living on Southampton's 3,240 streets, it's the inconsistencies and disrepairs in the neighbourhoods outside the city centre that impact their well-being and travel choices. So how can residents and the council work better together to make sure that the streets we live on are good enough for us all? This is one road I will not miss when we move to Portswood. I'm sure there'll be other roads that, that I will find equally annoying, but...